Hello, adventurers. My name is Kitchen, and today we're checking out Across the Obelisk, uh, a new game that came out not long ago, no less than two weeks for, since full release. It, uh, it has been in early access for over a year, and uh, it's finally out. I didn't. I did not play it during the early access, but here we are. Uh, this is the series is sponsored by Jawafa RPG, another streamer. Uh, he really wanted to play this with me, so he bought it for me, and now we are playing it solo first. But then later on, there's multiplayer options uh, where you can play this game with a friend. So, what is this game all about, Kijun? Well. If you know Slay the Spire or Darkest Dungeon, then you have an inkling on what's going on in this game already. Uh, it is kind of a mix-up between those two. Uh, you have four characters working together against uh, in a, a, like a, an adventure mode, where you go through different fights, battles, and uh, then each of these characters in every fight will have their own Slay the Spire-like deck. So you have four Slay the Spire decks going at the same time with different combos and stuff like that. It's a really intricate mix, and uh, it really works out super well. I, I'm very impressed by this game. Um, uh, and if you play the multiplayer then... I'm not sure if I can show that quickly here. No, it doesn't matter. Let me go back from that and just go in and play a single player mode and we can show it just as well uh, so real quick uh, before we start here I want to show you that there are three different main modes that you can play in this game and we are going to be playing the adventure mode this is where you unlock new things and learn the story as you play through it for the first time uh, then you have a fully random roguelike mode where you where everything is randomized. I think in the adventure mode, it's a little bit more predetermined and there are some specific events that you can and will always have to go, or will not always have to go through, but you some specific events that you need to, to do in order to unlock things and stuff like that. And then you have a weekly challenge, which you know what that's about. And you, uh, you probably want to be playing the Obelisk challenge here. It sounds kind of fun, but in order to unlock things, as I said, you have to play the adventure mode and I'm not done unlocking things yet. For reference, I have about 20 hours in the game now, and so I have unlocked a little bit uh, of stuff already. Um, and when you open the game for the first time, you will have uh, Magnus, Andrin, Evelyn, and Reginald unlocked. These are the starting characters that you will be playing in your first run. And then there are about, well, 12 additional characters that you can lock throughout the game. They are divided into four groups, as you can see here, four classes, if you will. And each class shares a card pool, uh, but then each different type or like archetype within those classes, like Reginald and Otis, will have different starting decks and different level of abilities that they can apply uh, to themselves throughout a run to specialize. And so if we open up, for example, uh, Reginald, a, uh, uh, he's like a cleric type, a healer. And you get a little bit of backstory about him. There's a lot of stuff to take in. I'm trying to to sort of lay it out for, for you here before we start playing. Each character will have resistances. Then we have a starting item and their starting deck down here at the bottom with the number of how many of that specific cards are in the deck. And then this tree here is the level up tree. So you start with the, the innate trait and then every level you can choose between one of the two level up uh, traits to specialize your specific for your specific run here so this is original if I click on Otis here you will see that he has a kind of a different setup he still has access like I said before to the exact same card pool when you start playing the game uh, when we get new cards, of course, er after every uh, battle, like in both, uh, no, not both, uh, but in, in Slay the Spire, after every battle, you will have a choice between three different cards. And f this will be true in this game as well for every character in the, that run. And they, again, they pull from the same uh, card pool. So healers pull from the same pool, mages from the same, scouts and warriors. Uh, a, a scout can never get a warrior card to my knowledge, and so and so forth. A mage will never have access to scout and warrior, so and so forth. As far as I'm aware, there may be ways to break that rule, but it's very, very uncommon then. Anyway, so Otis and Reginald share pool, but have different 
uh, traits that they can use to specialize their build and i am not like fully into in every one of them or just for example for me is a completely new unlock so i've never played with him before uh, i have played reginald and cornelius here for a little bit there's just a lot of stuff to take in more than that then we have a rank screen where after every run you get rank points this will be shared between all of your characters so every one of my guys is the same rank even though right now they don't uh say that underneath their uh um, <clears throat> their uh, portrait here that's because i haven't spent odysseus points in here yet so there's a whole perk tree which is the next thing that we have to cover in the perk tree, you can specialize your character further for your specific run. And you have save slots to make different builds. So you can get extra HP, resistance, starting gold, starting shots, more on that later, sight. Then you can specialize them towards different physical abilities, different elemental abilities, different mystical abilities. Here's the healing thing. So <clears throat> uh, that again, this is personal between for every one of the the characters so i have made a, a perk build for uh Thules here we have a perk build for sylvie and so on and so forth then there are some cosmetic stuff like skins and card bags which of course is super important but not like uh, game play affecting all right and so we're gonna play a adventure mode run i'm gonna set up what i have planned out for this one i have uh it, it, it does recommend you that you put a defense character in the front here, a, uh, a sort of scout in the second spot, a mage here, and then a healer in the back. But we are going to break that system right now. So I'm putting Magnus in the front. He's my only um, defense character. And I will say that there's a lot of monsters that hit the front character specifically. So it's really nice to have a tanky guy up front. That would be Magnus. He fills that role. Then we are going to run Thules and Sylvie and no mage for a little combo here. So I will put probably Sylvie in the back there. Oh, I'll put her there. No, I think I switched them around. Sylvie in the back, Thules in the second spot, and then Reginald here in the third spot. And I'll explain my reasoning. Uh, I like Sylvie specifically. If we open her up here, she has something called Keen Sight, focusing on the sight thing. Uh, sight. Let me explain that one really quick. When you are playing against the enemy uh, AI, they will do uh, kind of like in Darkest Dungeon or Slay the Spire even, they have like this, um, the, they plan out their turn before you do or do your thing. And then uh, in this game, it's hidden. You don't know what the enemy is doing until you play sight on them. Then you get to see what the enemy is doing and you can read their abilities. If you apply, yeah, if you apply sight, and then usually that's not super effective. But in this case with Sylvie, a keen sight says sight on enemies also reduce their piercing resistance. So we are going to try to run a little bit of a piercing build with this to uh, to kick some butt. And so I'm bringing Sylvie with a sight build, and Thule's also going to focus on sort of the same. He's more like an assassin type. So he focuses a lot on stealthing and then attacking from stealth, which gives you bonus damage and, and, and heal if you do that. Very cool. And also a lot of poison. So it'll be like a poison bleed sight kind of combo, which is interesting. I'm not sure if it's going to work, but we'll see. So that those two and then Reginald. Reginald also does a bit of sight as a base in his deck here. And so that's why we're bringing him. He can apply sight for free, which is pretty cool. Usually not one of my favorite ones, but again, with Sylvie, it comes useful. So we'll try it out. I will show you my perk builds here, which I have set up ahead of time so that we don't spend hours and hours on setting this up for this specific run here. I'm just going to show you what I have built, uh, focusing on healing with him and then whatever else he can do. Uh, I think building some extra resistance and health on every character is super important. And one extra starting energy for every combat is also very, very, very nice. So that's for uh, Reginald there. Then we look at Sylvie's build. She's focused a little bit more on defensive again because she's very squishy. But then physical, she's focused on piercing, building sharp. And you can pause the screen, of course, and read more about these if you are interested. But of course, I will cover more of all of that in the playthrough itself. So this is her setup. 
not poison for her, which is probably a mistake. Let me make sure that she adds an extra poison stack if we can here. Uh, there. Confirm that. And then Thule's kind of like Sylvie. I uh, will try to do the same thing. We try to focus on piercing, although he has a little bit more slashing built in at the beginning. So we focus on that one too. Could give him bleed as well. Yeah, I think we should focus on th these two guys need really need to do the damage for this run. So let's try to do it like that. And then Magnus is focused most, mostly on defense and physical here. I've gone all the way down here to in blocking. A little bit of crushing because that's his specialty. And I like building thorns just because that's cool. Okay, so that's the setup for this run. Let's just begin the adventure. There's also a madness thing that you can apply. I have not beaten a run yet, so uh, I don't... Uh, I, this is like Ascension in Slay the Spire. And uh, we so far none of that, but something to apply to make the thing more difficult later down the line. Not sure why you are rank three actually. I thought, I thought the uh, maybe I misunderstood the rank thing, huh? Maybe that's just how much you played the individual character. Each character will gain points after an adventure. With each new rank, a character will unlock new features. But again, I don't think this is uh, yeah. This is not like uh, gameplay affecting the rank thing. This is for the skins and the card backs. So, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I thought it was related to the perk system. My bad. Let's begin the adventure. It all started on the princess's 16th birthday. When suddenly, a burst of energy erupted from the princess's chamber and swept through the kingdom of Synenthia. The royal guards explored every corner of the castle, but found no sign of her or Lord Hanshek. The court magician. The king sent soldiers all over the kingdom, but none of them returned. The trail of the princess was lost deep in the old forest, near the ancient obelisk that had been dormant for centuries. Desperate, the king proclaimed a royal decree announcing a reward for whoever brought the princess home safely. The news spread quickly throughout the kingdom. Many groups of adventurers prepared to investigate the obelisk. This is the story of one of those groups. I hope that was audible. Of course, we had to see the... The opening scene the first time you play and I think I want to turn up the audio just a, a smidgen for you guys here. Anyway, and then now we're in the game. The first thing that happens in every run will always be a little town visit. We get one of these after every one of the uh, major bosses of course. Uh, and um, in the town then is its own little thing. This is where we start to see something a little bit more like uh, the Darkest Dungeon where you you set up for a run, uh, again, not merged with the Slay the Spire kind of thing. So um, in the town, the first thing you do when you come to town is always to go to the town upgrades and spend whatever uh, supplies you may have accrued in your previous run. So let's go and do that. Here you can see the upgrades that I have already done. And uh, we don't want to spend ages doing this in the first playthrough that I show you guys. But I think we unlock the common cards now, or uncommon cards in the crafting and that'll be it for now maybe I, i'll pick i'll get the armory if we need to buy a thing so you can pause the screen here and look at the upgrades but it doesn't really matter right now another cool little thing is uh I, if you look up here uh, i have some last rewards from previous runs uh, you can stack up to three of these chests these are chests that we can then uh, spend in this run to start with a, 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 a large amount of gold and, and shards to boost our run. Uh, when I do this, it'll take me forever to spend the gold and the shards, and it will also make the whole thing a lot more complicated. So I think we save that for later runs as well. We'll make a simple run here where we don't spend any of my previous chests, just to give an introductory uh, playthrough here. So in the, the town, you have access to your decks, you can look at it here and it shows you the average energy cost of your deck, which I think is very cool. Every one of them. Oh, not every one of them is at one necessarily. Interesting. Okay. 
we have access to different uh well shops and, and things in the magic forge you can craft new cards for a deck or uh, only ones that we have discovered in previous playthroughs can be crafted in here and you now we just unlocked the uncommon stuff for crafting i think it's the rare ones that we've no okay uncommon cards can now be crafted mm -hmm. i'm not sure we will be crafting much right now um at least i haven't planned anything out specifically i do like the deflect maybe we will take the deflect here See, that's almost all of our shards. Oh, we should focus on upgrading first. In the church, you can remove cards from your deck. You do have to have a minimum of 15 uh, cards in any given deck, so you can't go in and just remove everything. They are free right now because I have an upgrade that says the remove card removal is free in the first town of a run. So that means if you craft a card, you can then remove another one for free, which is good. Again, if you were spending the chests, you could probably do an hour's worth of playthrough just sitting here and min-maxing your deck. In the altar, this is where we upgrade our cards. We can upgrade them with a shard, and there's always two upgrade paths for every card. I'm not sure we're going to do a whole lot right now. I, I prefer doing this later in the run. Uh, after the first realm is usually fairly easy, and then in the next realm we know where the build is going and stuff like that. So, and mm, I don't feel like we need to upgrade a whole lot of stuff right now. Maybe we will take one of these quick shots and make this one free. I do like doing that for her specifically. So like that. It's a very simple little upgrade here. We have the Zingarian card where we can go and do a divination thing. This will allow us to get an, a, a card roll for every one of them. Like as if you have just defeated a battle. Uh, you would get a choice of one of three cards for every character. We only have the fast divination unlocked. In, uh, later on, I can unlock the better divinations. We need to give higher tier cards. And then you have the armory where you can buy items or equipment. Sylvie starts with a pet, which is very cool. Bird of Prey being cast every year every round by her. So this uh, card here will be played uh, automatically by the pet here, which is very cool. I haven't unlocked any pets. Oh, no, that's not true. I have the bunny. Ah, and we should buy the bunny for Magnus, for sure. Uh, so let's go and I don't know if this town upgrade says cost of items in the town armor is reduced. Okay, sure. I'm sure that'll include the, uh, the bunny there. It didn't. Okay. Uh, being fast, which is what the, this pet here does. It gives you extra speed. So you can uh, more initiative, if you will. It allows your, your character to act faster in a round. And it's super important for the, the, the block character to have that. Block does not uh, carry over between rounds. So you do need him to be early in the round in order to uh, have the greatest effect, as you might imagine. Giving him the bunny is great. Uh, other than that, we will look briefly through here and we, the main thing that we're looking for is this little gem up here the green gem or no gem there'll be a blue a purple and a uh and a, a yellow one of course for the legendary and the higher ones are usually the better ones um so we probably will not spend money on a blank one but look at this crystal ball damage with hit apply one sight let's try that out i think that's pretty cool Looking through here to see if there's anything else that we might want, but no. And I know Sylvie does a lot of like multi attacks and stuff, so she gets the crystal ball, I think. That is pretty cool. Now we do more sight to apply more debuff, basically. We'll see if that works out. And the shards, uh, you can never have enough shards. I mean, with 3000, we might be able to do some upgrades here and, and stuff. For now, I will save it for later in this run. Uh, so, not a lot of setup. Let's start playing the game. And, um,. We should talk briefly here uh, about what we can do. This is uh, a character event here with the little uh, face and the exclamation point. And this means that we can unlock a character here. So you see, this is the, the pick guy. Otis has already been unlocked. We're not really interested in that. But if we come up here and look, here's a character that I have not unlocked. So I think we will be heading for the crumbling tower. And I think we could go through the suspicious hatch to get there. I'm not sure how that uh 
if if we allowed to do that through here but that would be pretty cool the suspicious hatch is a very little cool little thing that i want to show you guys so if, if to get there we do have to go through the northern area and so we will and here's the first enemy uh, group uh, a bunch of cornies oh and there's a little tutorial that i haven't actually had up on the screen before because i've only played multiplayer so energy managing cards you can cast cards until you run out of energy when you end a turn energy that hasn't been used will be saved for the next turn of this hero so not how you normally play a card builder in my experience uh let me repeat that uh energy carries over between rounds so you do not have to spend all of your energy every round in this game pretty big deal uh, then there's specific targeting for cards, front monster, for example, for this one. And that's it for now. So when we play Magnus, the first card we play, now he, he draws randomly, but he drew what, a lot of cards here. Not sure why he drew so many. Uh, usually it's five. Uh, he has an Enrage card here, which is one of his starting cards. Uh, you see here that it's got a little purple gem. And this uh, costs one energy, then he plays it on himself. It burns the card, or it vanishes. He draws one and gains two energy. So there's literally no loss here. We gain an energy effectively by playing that one. Very cool. Always play uh, that one, of course. And then we have a Captain's Howl here, which applies slow and vulnerable to the enemy. You can pause and read the things if you want. But vulnerable, of course, being nice because it lowers their resistances. And this is free and it applies it to all monsters, then vanishes the card. No reason not to play it. Then we are going to start spending our energy. He has five. And uh, we can't see what they're doing because we don't have sight on their cards here. But we will do a barricade. Uh, this gives every hero some block. Very nice. We have an intercept card, which is free. So, of course, we will play it. I think uh, we will probably do both the attacks here. The first fight, we just want to try to end it quickly. Oh, and on that note, the, there's a little round counter up here at the, at the top. And uh, if you finish the, a fight in the first round, you get a performance bonus. Or you, you do... The, get that in the second round as well and so on and so forth but um yeah the the the, the faster you can finish a fight the more uh, rewards the better reward you get in this game so while it's it, it can be cool to do some um build up and and slow play i think uh finishing fast is honestly what matters the most in most cases speed and character order so this is the noted here this is the speed of the character all characters have a speed value the value establishes who moves first. In case of a tie, the closest hero to the center will have priority. That's the center of the map here. So Magnus would go first if they were equal. Good. Thules, then, is all about stealth. Uh, and I think in, if you read his level and trait here, at the start of the combat, he gains two stealth. That's his major thing. Stealth gives you extra damage, uh, but it is removed as soon as you play a card. So, uh, and you lose one stack at the end of the round as well. So he's stealth right now. The first card we play then will do extra damage. And so some of his cards require stealth as well, like the ambush card here. Super high damage attack. We will play this first uh, to maximize the damage. This is the calculated damage of, of the card. So once I play that, it will. Uh, these numbers here have already added the the current stealth bonus that he is getting. So we will play that, and I think just to the back line here, boom, already dead effectively. The poison here will kill it. I'm not sure why they all have poison. Uh, that is from the, his venom flask. I see. At the start of combat, apply three poison to all monsters, which does damage at the end of the enemy turn. That's also something to take note of. Some uh, debuffs, da damage debuffs like poison, some of them will do damage at the beginning of the turn, at the, the enemy turn, and some of them will be do damage after the enemy has taken their turn. And I think, I think poison is the only one, in fact, that does at the damage at the end of their turn. So they, he will get to do his one card, but he's effectively already dead. So that's kind of nice. And we are going to move first with all of our characters here. We have Killer Instinct on self. It would dispel Mark on yourself, then gain energy and gain three stealth. So we can go into stealth again and then do another big hit. We could do Viper Strike, Dual Strike, Front Marcher. We gotta think he might already effectively be dead here. Seven and seven. Uh, 
I think we can finish him off with the 20 damage if I do Killer Instinct here. That will give me 3 stealth, so 60% extra damage. That is indeed a kill on the fronter, frontliner there. And then we just play the whole thing on the middle guy that we can. The poison dart being free here. Just like that. The bird attacks the back line. Okay, so that, that was maybe a little bit wasted, but whatever. Good, good stuff though. And then I think rapid fire will kill this guy. This one shoots uh, once and then repeats twice. So this is 30 damage. He's basically already dead from that. All right. Uh, maybe I play uh, a vigilance here. We have the mana. So I'll play a vigilance. Just to show, now we have sight on the enemy that will re reveal three cards. He only has one. So now we can see what he's doing, which is kind of nice. Uh, and popcorn burst, it says here it attacks a random hero and then he repeats it twice. Of course, he won't get to do that now. We'll just kill him with rapid fire. And so we won in the first round, getting the excellent performance bonus here. Extra money, extra XP, which is what this one is, and score. I think this also translates into XP. I'm not 100% sure about that. And then card tier goes up. So very nice. Everyone gets a choice of three different cards. Or they can choose to pick up shards if you don't want to pollute your deck with unnecessary cards. And I do think that you should be very careful about what cards you add to your deck. So we will. Uh, Magnus can get defend, charge, gaining extra speed, or headbutt. And I think here we will take none of those. Not a bad card, but I want to go into defense build with him. And the defend is not a good card for him. Uh, we, we will get better cards. So take the shards there. Then uh, the Thule's character, he has a thing here. Uh, this is a song spell. Granting speed could be good. Not what I want to focus on. Sawtooth Knight is a small weapon. Uh, and I think he has a thing with small weapons. Let me check that real quick. Here. Uh, when you play a melee attack. No. When you play... Oh, this is not him then. There's a, another guy who has something with small weapon. Oh, no, no. This is the one here. When you play a small weapon card, put a random small weapon card in your hand. And that's kind of cool. Veil of Shadows. When you play a skill enchantment card, you don't lose stealth. I think I prefer the white sleeves over here, so we could take up the small, uh, the sawtooth knife to combo with that later. But uh, it's we can bet, get better small weapons than this. I, I don't think we will be grabbing anything here either. These are fairly low tier cards. Uh, he, another heal, infuse courage, gaining shield. Shield is block, but applied in the next round. So uh, like I said before. Uh, Block does not carry over between rounds, but then shield will be block for next round, which is kind of interesting. And then we have clairvoyance here, which gives all monsters uh, some psychic damage, and then it applies to sight to every monster, which means more damage from the two scouts. So why don't we... I'm not sure about this one, but I'll, I'll pick it up. Why not? Let's go for that sight build. And then we have Sylvie. Sylvie has a, an annoying whistle, applying uh, Insane, which lowers mind resistance. We're not really focused on that, even though we just picked up a card that does it. We, we could start building mind uh, damage, which the annoying whistle itself also does. Random monster for 15 damage, not, not bad. We have a blur, which goes uh, gives her stealth and one evasion. Evasion will dodge one entire hit. This is actually a pretty nice pickup for her, I think. This is a good card. Uh, invasion just is powerful in itself, just completely blocking one attack. And then you have the sneak pick, which requires stealth. And I think she already has that one. No, that's not her. She does have two camouflages to go into stealth already. And it's very important to note that stealth doesn't stack. So you don't want to be building too much stealth. No, that's not true. Ah, but the point is that when when you go, are in stealth and you play another stealth card, you break stealth before you play the next card, right? I, I said that before. When you are in stealth and you play any card, you lose all stealth. So you can't continually build up stealth. I think I will pick up the blur for her. That is kind of cool. Getting the evasion and the the one energy going into two stealth means 40% extra damage on her next attack. So it's like a setup mechanic and it's really cool. It works out. And uh, yeah, that was the first battle. 
let us do another one. We're aiming for the suspicious hatch, so we have to keep going north here. And now we have an event. Crops on fire. Events will pop up eventually, uh, like periodically, and we'll see. We can get various effects out of this. And there's a little story that I will read out, of course. So, crops on fire. Near the farm, you come across a burned field and a burning house. In front of the house, there's a fire imp causing fires next to some burning cornies. Even half burned, the house may contain something valuable, but you'll have to deal with the fire imp and cornies first. You can deal with the imp and investigate the house, or ignore him. So we have choices. We can either attack the, head imp, uh, the imp head on, which is just initiate combat. Then we have stealth, hide in the cornfields and attack him by surprise. So then we have a, a role here. Uh, so it gives us the success prob probability over here. But the real thing is that it, everyone draws a, res uh, a card from their deck and then the results are added up and we are trying to hit five mana costs or lower total. Uh, again, 71 probability is the the real kicker here. It's the easiest one is just to check the probabilities. Then there's a Sylvie specific event who says, I'll try to snipe the imp from here. If she does that, uh, she in order to do that, she needs to pull a ranged card from her deck and there's a high probability of that. Cool. Or we can sneak away, continue on your way without attracting the imp's attention uh, if we want to avoid the combat. Oh, well, we, we have a high chance of that. But I want to fight them, and I'm, I don't see why we wouldn't try to snipe the imp. So, 75% chance. Sylvie pulled me a range card. She did. Sylvie draws her bow, and after a brief moment, fires an arrow that hits the imp, uh, imp's head, killing it instantly. The two remaining cornies run off in panic. Oh, so we don't get the combat. Oh, interesting. Okay, we, you know, combat gives us cards and XP, so I was like, hmm. Maybe maybe this is bad. Obviously, maybe we get something good here. The burning house. You are at the entrance of the burning house. Clearly, this was a poor man's house, and you can see that the contents inside are burned, are destroyed or burned. Before you leave, a chest catches your eye, although the chest is still on fire. The fire is spreading rapidly, and there will be nothing left in a few moments. Will you venture into the flames for a poor man's chest? So we can loot and rush into the house and try to get the chest out. Or just leave. Or Thule says, I'm fast enough to go in and get it. And uh, he's not. <laughs> uh, no, I think we will uh, do the group thing and try to loot here. 78 is pretty high. So now the whole group draws a card and we need to beat four. We did. Critical success. So sometimes, and I'm not sure how much you have to beat it with. If you go a certain number above a requirement, you can get a critical success. and uh, Or vice versa, if you go too low before below a, a target you can also have a critical failure which gives you bad stuff but here we come out safely with the chest miraculously you see it's, it's intact and in, also inside the house you find an old rope that seems to be useful you proceed to open the chest so we get a, a, a stack of items and each character gets to pick one uh, and magnus so they this is a ring slot giving resistance bandage here from the potion slot recovers HP at the end of the fight. Combat start gain extra HP. Nice for the combat. Uh, dirty bandages is the lower version of the bandages. Leather armor is just resistance, which is nice. And then he can do more uh, psychic damage. I think the psychic damage is a nice pick for uh, Reginald there. Uh, it'll either be the leather armor, but he gets way better armors later. So I'm not sure he should pick that one. Maybe the earrings. I've never really done a vitality build. Or we could just pick up the bandages. Someone should pick the bandages. Uh, that may go on silly. No, but you know what? He he doesn't really need the resistances and stuff. I'll give that to some of the weaker characters. Uh, oh, and so for... Good old Thules, I think he gets the opal ring. Reginald will pick the runestone to do more mind damage. Not super effective, but, it, you know, we can definitely use it right now. And then I'll give the leather armor to Sylvie. Good. Not, not a huge deal, those things. But we got the, the old rope here. A useful rope that you used to help rebuild, uh, that you used to help rebuild a house. Hmm. 
I think that's what we need for the suspicious hatch, actually. Let's do another combat here. Oh, and we see another cool little thing. So sometimes there will be this obelisk corruption. The obelisk's influence is corrupting the monsters in this area. You can choose to fight them under the effects of corruption to increase the difficulty and add and gain additional rewards. So we can see the monsters that we are fighting out here. Uh, if we do this, if we accept the challenge, all monsters will gain extra HP, do more damage, and every round all monsters will get a 5 buffer. Buffer uh, uh, prevents curses, and curses is, means debuff. Every, every kind of debuff is a curse, so basically this is a, a debuff protection. Pretty nasty. Uh, probably something we could beep, beat. So now we, if we did that, we would have a choice of two rewards. So either Thules would get the Vitalizing Serenade card for free. Uh, and that's this one over here. Uh, probably not one we want. Uh, this one specifically requires Stanza 1, and not something I've talked about, but the Scouts can be like bards, and that means that they need to sing songs in order to ac activate other songs, gaining Stanza which then builds up over multiple rounds and stuff like that. Uh, but we do not have any ways to gain Stanza on any of our scouts at the moment. So we are not going to be picking this card. It would literally be unplayable. The other way, or the, other th the other thing that we could do is we can increase the quality and quantity of card rewards at the end of the combat. And I've never picked this one. So I think we will try it out. This should be doable. They do more damage and have more HP, but it's the only the second fight of the game, you know. So I think we can do it. It's a hard one, but... I'm confident. Oh, and look at that. The poison that we get for f at the start of the fight from fools and the burn from someone uh, it goes before the buffer that they get. So that does get to apply. That's kind of cool. Uh, again, uh, Magnus will be playing first and he pulled the enrage card. So I think he just plays that immediately. Something I haven't really talked about is the energy bar here. You can see the three green dots or bars is the energy that he will be earning next round. They have a maximum of 10. And then the yellow ones, of course, are the, one, the energy that he has right now. Not sure why these guys are only getting two each. Oh no, they start with two and then they will get more, right? So we start with five for each of them. Pretty cool. We will play the barricade again, because it's just so nice. Getting blocked for everyone, and then we will try to do some damage here. The rend would normally apply bleed, but since they have the debuff projection, we, it doesn't really do anything. Uh, so I won't play that, it's also very expensive for the effect. Intercept, there's no reason not to play it. I think we will buff ourselves with a bit of protection there, and then I will give it to... Reginald has low health compared to everyone else. We'll keep the defend or the mana here. Then it is what? Thules. Thules did not pull the backstab this time. We will do a big hit with the dual strike. Yes. That broke him out of stealth. Then we want to stealth again. Uh, to get another attack in, we could do the Viper Strike, only 6 damage, and the Poison will, of course, will be blocked. So that is unfortunate. But no reason not to do the Killer Instinct, I think. Do the Viper Strike. And then he doesn't have enough to kill it, that's unfortunate. So at 8, I think I don't want to use the Poison Darts on it, because someone else will have an, an 8 damage attack. Uh, and doing six to it then would get it down to two and then that would just be silly and overkill let's focus on the next in line the uh this one here poison dart will not do the poison but it will do the damage and it's free and then we end the turn with blur so that he carries some of his stealth over to the next turn all right sylvie then she pulled her special card, which is this Falcon shot here, dealing X damage, uh, X equals your hand. Then it applies upon your debuffs, but we also gain Sharp, which is um, a, a buff for her own damage. So I think we should play that first. Uh, maybe we can even apply some debuff to the backline guy here. Look at that. He has two buffer left after the, the bird did its thing. So if I Falcon shoot it, Like that. 
Now it has no buff protection anymore. Or debuff protection. Hmm. Maybe we do a camouflage into multi shot, which just hits all monsters. Uh, the quick shot will hit the frontliner, but might as well kill them with the multi shot first. This also gives her another three shot, which stacks. So now she's doing three extra piercing and slashing damage. Then we will do camouflage. Do multi shot now, it does 21. Because of the stealth and the sharp. So this is a lot of damage. Then the quick shot for free. And then I don't think we play the Vigilance. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, monster cards. The cards that the monsters are going to cast are hidden by default. The sight effect it will reveal these cards, allowing you to plan your movements in anticipation. But they are going to get to do their thing now. Look at that. They're healing a bit. Watering, yeah. Corn and farmers to help. Well, the, the corn, kind of funny. All right, first time we see Reginald having a turn. He has the Clairvoyance card, which does damage to all monsters. Healing rain is free. There's no reason not to play it. Uh, wet here will apply... Uh, well, it will apply one... The one wet, but also removes burn from the target. And for some reason, we have a burn over here, probably applied by the roasted corny there. So, no reason not to do play a kid do that. Oh, it hits everyone. That's right. Uh, but it also gives us regeneration, and it gave them regeneration too. So maybe a bad play. We'll see. There's two here. This is twenty-one damage. Then for uh, for two mana, I think that's uh, slightly better than. The flash, and it will apply some side debuff to some of them. Yeah, so why not, right? Good. And we don't really need the healing or any or the barrier, so I think we just flash our way through here. Uh, probably spreading the damage out because we have AoE, AoE stuff to kill them with. So I think we'll try it like that. And uh, yeah, save the mana for the barrier. We did not manage to kill them in the first round, but the second round is also considered excellent performance bonus. So let's see if we can do it in the second here. Magnix have has high speed. You might think that this is overkill, but later on there will be people who debuff his speed, and so it's really nice to boost it as much as we can. We play the damage, and I think we even play the rend here. Try to finish it this round. Hmm. Ambush with one stealth charge means 10% extra on top of this. I'm looking at the poison dart because that's precisely what we need to kill this guy right now. For, we could get that for zero mana. But probably killing him with a viper strike after the fact is just as fine. So I think we ambush. And you can see the damage calculation. I would, oh, we can see what they're doing. Popcorn burst again here, applying burn. And this one over here, Sickle attacking front hero. Uh -huh. And they're all going to go f before Reginald, but we have Silthy and Thruth first. I don't think we can do it this round, unfortunately. Uh, let me do it on the middle guy. Viber strike on the front guy. Yeah. And then we have Viper Strike again, of course, and a Poison Dart, I suppose, for the back line. We'll see if Sylvie can can take another kill here. Should be able to, but maybe both, even, if I'm lucky. Uh, having no stealth. Rapid Fire is interesting. It picks a random monster and attacks that one three times. It would kill the backliner, but it would not. Uh, it would overkill on the, the frontliner. So, oh, if I do quick shot, that kills the frontliner, and then we can play rapid fire, and that's the kill for the second guy, and then we've won. Just like that. Yes, perfect. Excellent, one would say. Oh, and so we get an extra card choice, and probably also uh, plus one cards tier. Yes, perfect. So sh surely we would find something here 
that is worth picking up. Another barricade is quite nice. I am going to try to build him specifically only blocking, and then I want some... There are some cards that give do damage based on how much block you have. Kind of like in Sp Slay the Spire. And so I think that's that'll be our build. But barricade, applying block to everyone, such a nice card. We can get another ambush card and an upgraded one of that. So here you can see uh, if you look at the text of any card, if it has a color, that means that it's upgraded. That's the way to tell whether a card is upgraded or not. There's also the sneak peek over here, which also requires stealth and gives you stealth. It's kind of nice, but I, the ambush is such a good card. And normally, uh, no, oh, I thought normally it went away, but this one doesn't. That's right. Doesn't burn or anything. No, I will get the the ambush. That's too good. Then, it, well, the only thing, of course, is that it requires stealth. So we will have to try to build a proper uh, stealth build with him. Uh, for Reginald, there's been a diction here, which applies bless. Bless will increase your damage done and heal received of the character who is blessed. Very cool. Bad augury applies sight and deals a little bit of dark damage okay and more foresight look at that my lens probably not what we're picking bad augury being upgraded it seems like it's just better than the foresight am i right yeah benediction is cool but another free card for him which applies sight i, th I see the combo potential here uh, we might remove one of the four sides later if it's too much, but I say we go for it for now. Here's a shift. It's kind of cool. Detection. All monsters gain one mark and two sight for one mana, though. Sarcastic Sonnet requires the stanza, so we're not picking that. And then there's the saw blade. I don't think she has anything with the, the small weapons. If we look who, you know, he, she's focused on ranged attacks, basically... We only want to build ranged attacks with her. And I think this is a no. We don't want any of this. And maybe the shiv. The shiv is cool. It upgrades into getting poison. Oh, or insane. Interesting. And it's nice having zero cost cards. Because we can rarely spend... Or we can rarely play all the cards because we don't have enough energy. So zero cost cards allows us to do more with our turn, with our draws. Since energy carries over, there's no... I can slay the spire if you draw zero cost cards for your entire turn and you can't spend your energy, you feel like you're being punished. In this game, the energy that you didn't spend just carries over to the next turn where you will then draw your higher cost cards because you drew all your free cards. It works out really well. So zero cost cards, you can have too many, don't get me wrong, but you're not like penalized if you have a few. All right. I think we will end the episode here. We'll keep them not in a full hour. Around, I was going to go for around 30 minutes, but this is fine. So I hope you guys will enjoy the playthrough of Across the Obelisk. See you guys soon, and bye-bye.